Good morning, folks. This is a Vimeo video of Mount Etna erupting over the weekend. It's a nice compliment to yesterday's shot from NASA's Earth Observatory. This guy apparently does little more than watch this specific volcano, and his videos show it. A link is provided. Speaking of NASA's Earth Observatory, latest image here is a beautiful shot of one of the rarest landscapes on Earth. The South Georgia Island has beautiful glacial mountains that trail down to incredible coastlines. This was a total shock to me. Not that 5 million tons of tsunami debris were created in Japan, that high windage debris could have gotten here already, or that way more is to come, but that the swath across the Pacific here is the highest density debris field, and that dotted part close to the California coastline is the highest density of all. No idea it was that close. With this link are two other important ones if you are checking on your own time. As I watch the anomaly free total electron content over the US, I thought it prudent to revisit the undeniable energetic change in our atmosphere. Here's the quick version. In 1999, they began monitoring the critical frequency of the F1 layer over Gakona, Alaska. I've skewed the timeline at the bottom, putting northern winter near the middle of the chart so we can demonstrate that dip. It is indeed supposed to follow the exposure to the sun and Earth's tilt is expected to put this guy in the dark for part of the year. But let's jump back quickly to get to know the ionosphere and critical frequencies. This is how it is set out above our heads in layers. The top layers are vital for radio communication. We like to bounce radio waves off the F2 layer. But to do so, we need to understand that the critical frequency of a layer is the highest frequency propagation that can be skipped off that layer. If it's higher than the F2 critical frequency, the wave will pass right through and go off into space. If the frequency is not higher than the F1 layer critical frequency, it will bounce off that layer and never make it up to the F2. These are directly dependent on the ambient energy held within that layer of the atmosphere. Okay, now watch this. Solar maximum happening in the early 2000s, so we go up slightly. Then we come back down for solar minimum. But while the minimum began to break records and wear out his welcome by an extra two years, our planet took that opportunity to get pretty juiced up. This is one of the top five data points we track, and it's no joke. Coming to the solar wind, where in yellow you should see a wave of speedy particles. No major impact, obviously, but our shields did react to the disturbance. The auroral electrojet lit up as energy was integrated into the system, with matching baseline inductions that bounced back up to 2.5 Hz as the stream died down. In the wake, however, we are still having plasma penetration, more signs of our failing shield. Folks, we are past the Saturn solar opposition. We got no Earth-facing umbral openings. Even as the coronal hole faces Earth directly, the umbral opening and pop there appear not to favor Earth's direction. Flaring, still not gotten back up into M range, but the fun is surely picking up with lots of active regions. Starting up top, yesterday we still saw monster umbras, but this morning I see fading spots hiding behind a magnetic labyrinth. The south central sunspot here, yesterday I told you the red needed to grow a bit, which it did, but it would help if the rest of our buddies could keep their act together. Leaving our guys on the southeastern limb for the hundredth time, let's watch a beast crest into view and see if the earth facing quiet can quell her demons or if she'll overcome nearly two uninterrupted years of flaring fail facing earth. I can tell you, she showed up to the party ready to rumble as you can see here. I'll leave you with shots of the eastern limb as that's where the action and filaments are. Eyes open. No fear, it's 6.20 a.m. Eastern Time, and that's the news. Be safe, everyone.